Hello, this is Dawn here with a recording that I was given to share for Sunday, March 15th, 2020. The world is in the midst of um, grappling with the various uh, aspects of a global challenge at the moment. And there are as many ways to see current circumstances as there are colors in the rainbow and even beyond and the colors that we see or associate, the typical seven colors. And while we might separate those out, those are, each one is merely a perspective um, that is delineated and defined by the position of the person who is uh, the viewer or the one looking at the situation and their own frame of reference and also defined by the frequency of light. Uh, the frequency of light that that individual is holding, the frequency of light in which they find themselves, in, which includes their environment, both uh, local and then going out to you know regional, national, global, and whatever uh, spheres of influences in which, uh, or context, the context of community that they are in or their, their sphere of influence. So it's a time of uh, confusion for many. And all of these perspectives that are so varied, um, there is one underlying uh, common denominator that I wish to share, which is that any perspective is only made possible by the one light that shines through the prism of our world or that shines through whatever may be happening. So it is the light that makes possible all perspectives. And it is one light, uh, one foundation um, of love that is the substrate of all things in in the way that I understand our being and becoming uh, in this time and any time. So this video is going to be an offering of various connecting points and perspectives, not in terms of the specifics, um, but rather I'm gonna approach it um, from two areas, one being the area of uh, language and definition, and the second being um, what I often draw from, which um, is the treasured text um, from the Christian tradition, which is, is my background, and it's what I'm given to share. So I'm going to share some thoughts about that, but it, it's not meant in terms of one defining truth because, again, the truth is this. There is but one light and one love, and there is a crown of many crowns belonging to one who is to me the one true king, the writer who will emerge to show us the open door. And those who walk through, who enter um, that door, those who pass through the gates will receive their crowns. But first, we must face Golgotha, the place of the skull to which we led him after we placed him, um, after we placed upon him a, a crown of thorns. So I'm going to touch on the various crowns in this um, sharing, and I'm just going to speak, you know, kind of from my heart and soul. I'm going to reference quite a few uh, definitions, as I mentioned, and also I'm going to reference. Um, some various uh, passages um, from the biblical tradition. So first, let's start with two really broad definitions um, and as we move into what I'll share. The first uh, definition is the definition of the word spectrum because I'm really talking here from a spectrum of perspectives. I'm gonna talk about you know, the seven colors of change and the definitions uh, of a word that is at the root of what we're grappling with at the moment. And I'm also gonna talk about uh, seven crowns and uh, also touch on some promises that we can hold to in this time together. And then I'm gonna close with um, just some thoughts about the crown of thorns uh, and transforming that crown of thorns into the crown of many crowns. So spectrum. What is a spectrum? We talk about a spectrum of ideas, a spectrum of color, a spectrum of, you know, it's used in many different ways. A spectrum is a band of colors 
such as that that's seen in a rainbow. And a spectrum is produced by the separation of components of light by their different degrees of refraction according to wavelength. I'm going to read that again. That's just the actual definition of the word spectrum. A band of colors as seen in a rainbow produced by separation of the components of light by their different degrees of refraction according to wavelength. So we are waves. We are, that's, that's who we are at our very nation, nature. You know, we are a frequency of light um, and we have a choice in the matter. And that's why I'm going to talk about the seven colors of change and the choice and, the, and what is the perspective that we are choosing in any moment. So spectrum means a band of colors um, produced by separation of the components of light by their different degrees of refraction according to wavelength. A spectrum also means um, something that's used to classify or suggest um, a classification in terms of its position on a scale between two extreme or opposing points or opposite points. So the spectrum implies everything between the two polar opposites. And uh, most of you, I think, who follow me at this channel know that I, um, I draw what is meaningful to me in this life from uh, the teachings of Jesus. And, you know, one thing that's missed a lot is that, that Jesus actually taught very much about holding the two um, two quote, opposing viewpoints, um, those polar opposites as one. And that is an opportunity that has presented itself time and time again in recent uh, months and years and, and perhaps decades or centuries or millennial, uh, millennia as you can um, you know, kind of trace it back through time in a variety of ways, uh, you know, back to the garden um, of good and evil and, um, and, you know, various, uh, ways that we have seen dark and light and, and good and bad and all of that. So, so when we consider this word spectrum, you know, we're thinking about, you know, this very human tendency to classify, to put something as a note on the scale or to put it as a point on a line or to see it, uh, through a certain lens, um, and to, uh, uh, per, be persuasive about um, our point of view. And when we are doing all those things, which are, you know, incredibly and intrinsically a part of what it means to be human, um, and, and so not to dissuade um, or to throw that out, you know, completely, but we are, are merely, you know, it's a point in time. It's one perspective. It's one way of seeing. And often we lose sight of the full spectrum of possibility. And most importantly, we forget the light that makes the spectrum and all of the beautiful colors of the rainbow, the various uh, frequencies that we embody as humans possible. It is one light. So spectrum is one definition I wanted to touch on. Because of what we're grappling with in our world right now, I also wanted to look at the definition of a virus just so that we all understand um, that that refers to an infective agent that typically consists of a nucleic acid molecule in a protein coat, and it is too small to be seen by light microscopy. It is also able to multiply, but only within the living cells of a host. So it is a, a virus is something that gets into the host, into each of the individual components or cells that make up a, a living being, and then it, it multiplies. And then there are some other things that I'll leave, but you can go and research, you know, what that means. So, you know, right now in our world, we are dealing with something, COVID-19, which has been uh, called coronavirus. And I want to look at seven definitions, you know, seven shades of change is what I let, you know, kind of see these as. And this change is happening. Um, and these are seven perspectives of the colors of change that are occurring and the levels in which, uh, through which we can understand um, looking at language as one lens. 
we can understand, um, you know, kind of what's unfolding. So corona is a word that originated in the 16th century, and it's from the Latin for wreath or crown. Um, associated words that you know we might use would be you know, coronation, um, and then I'm going to touch on seven perspectives of that word. Um, so let's just dive right into that, and let me touch on that, and then we're we're going to um, move in from these definitions. We're going to talk about seven crowns, but first. Um, ways of seeing uh, this word, corona. Um, the first would be astronomy, and in terms of sun, moon, and stars, um, what the meaning there is of that word is the rarefied gaseous envelope of the sun and other stars. The sun's corona is normally visible only during a total solar eclipse when it is seen as an irregularly shaped pearly glow surrounding the darkened disk of the moon or outer extremely hot plasma layer of the sun. So this definition of this word is, you know, a scientific uh, description of sun, moon, and stars and, and a, uh, an effect that um, is seen at certain points uh, in the skies. So let's bring it down to earth and let's look at the science of matter and energy. The word corona there means the glow around a conductor at high potential. It also can mean a small circle of light as seen again around the sun or moon due to diffraction by water droplets. So again, imagine looking through a water droplet and the, the light that passes through that droplet is refracted and therefore we, we see that halo effect. Um, so. We've looked at astronomy and the science um, of matter and energy. Let's look at the world of weather. There is a corona phenomenon that is also referred to sometimes as St. Elmo's fire, which was also, of course, a movie back in uh, the 80s. And this uh, is a phenomenon that is also seen as a, a harbinger of hope. And um, what happens is a, um, a discharge or corona is created um, when it's refracted, light is refracted off of a, a sharp or pointed object in a strong electric field in the atmosphere. So, for example, a thunderstorm uh, or a volcanic eruption can create this effect. And the, the term St. Elmo's Fire, it's named after St. Erasmus, um, also called St. Elmo, who was one, uh, I'm sorry, which is one, St. Elmo is one of two Italian names for St. Erasmus. Uh, so St. Erasmus and St. Erasmo, <coughs> Erasmo, <coughs> excuse me, are um, <coughs> the patron saint of sailors. And so this St. Elmo's fire effect is, uh, it would sometime appear on ships at, she at sea, <laughs> ships at sea during thunderstorms. And it was uh, those who were, you know, sailors who, um, were religious were really um, taken especially by this ball of light and um, and would call it St. Elmo's fire. They often considered it as a good omen and um, it's a it often appeared in the sky as like a bright blue or violet glow um, that looked like fire. So the blue light I think is is really something interesting because that has shown up in our world uh, of late in many ways. Um, I really invite you to read a little bit more about St. Elmo's Fire, too, because it's a form of plasma, which is fascinating in and of itself. Um, and there are certain conditions that create that effect. Um, so that's the world of, of uh, weather or meteorology. So those are three scientific um, ways of looking at that word corona, both, um, well, through the three aspects of astronomy, um, physics or, or the science of matter and energy, and then meteorology or the, the science of weather. So, and, and also, you know, you might say the world of the explorers as well. So let's look at history. In history, um, the word corona was a reference to a crown uh, or a garland that was uh, bestowed by the ancient Romans as a reward for distinguished service. Then let's look at um, living forms. Let's look at the uh, physiology or the anatomy of the human body. 
In this case, corona refers to the crown or the skull or the head or the mind, or the brain. Also, it refers to um, the circumference of the base of the penis in males. And so those uh, two um, aspects of the human anatomy are associated with this word. Then in the world of plants and botany, um, in terms of the anatomy of a flower, a corona refers to the cup-shaped or trumpet-shaped outgrowth of the center of a flower. And it's interesting, in many of the definitions, two flowers are mentioned, daffodils, which are associated with spring, and narcissus. So um, again, that's uh, the corona is the crown-shaped, funnel-shaped, or trumpet-shaped outgrowth or appendage um, of the perianth of certain flowers such as the daffodil or narcissus. So many, many interesting uh, connections there. And uh, I also find it interesting, the trumpet shape um, and many phenomenon in our world that have to do with trumpet sounds um, and then the references and how that ties into the biblical narrative, um, in particular, in particular <clears throat> the book of Revelation. Sorry for my voice there. Um, and finally, let's look at, okay, so that's a lot, you know, we've drawn from the worlds of science, um, both human science and then the, the hard sciences and, and astronomy and history. Also in architecture, the word corona has a meaning. It can mean two things. One is the top protruding edge of a cornice um, that has a broad vertical face. And so it's that top horizontal cap, if you will, um, that usually juts out. Um, it can also refer to, corona can also refer to the circular band of metal or wood that would contain candles around the rim. And it's usually hung, you know, from the top, from the ceiling, for example, of a cathedral, um, which is reminiscent of this idea of a, a crown of stars and um, any, well, really any circular halo um, with, uh, it could be a crown of jewels for that matter as well. So in architecture, uh, the word has meaning too. So those are, um, just seven examples of the various meanings of the word, all of which have something valuable to offer in terms of informing various perspectives. Um, so I invite you to think about those, um, as we move through this time together. Now I want to talk about seven crowns. Um, I'm drawing here uh, from my own perspective, which is merely one perspective. So I'm going to, within that one perspective, share seven uh, interpretations or um, connecting points um, that might have something to offer as we consider, <clears throat> as we consider, um, you know, everything, our lives, who we are, where we're headed, you know, where we've come from, um, how we can love one another, uh, who we want to be, the perspective we choose, um, the change we want to see and, and therefore be, and what uh, frequency of light we choose to embody in any given moment. So these are, um, are really seven crowns, and they're drawn from the biblical narrative and the Christian tradition, also the um, Hebrew tradition, because I'll cite some um, passages from the Old Testament of the Bible and the Jewish um, tradition there. So let's start with the first of seven crowns, which is the crown of wisdom. Proverbs 4, 6 through 9 talks about a crown of wisdom. It says, do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom, though it cost all you have, get understanding, cherish her and she will exalt you, embrace her and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. So Proverbs six, uh, 4, 6 through 9 talks about this crown of wisdom, the crown of wisdom. The second of the seven crowns is the crown of honor from Psalm chapter or psalm 8 says this lord our lord how majestic is your name in all the earth you have set your glory in the heavens 
Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the crown of honor, the crown of splendor, Reading from Isaiah chapter 62. Till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch, the nations will see your vindication and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. So this is the crown of splendor, the third crown. The fourth crown is the crown of love. I'm reading here from Psalm 103, the first five verses say this. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. This, the fourth crown, is the crown of love. The fifth crown is the crown of righteousness. Reading now from the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1-8. through 8. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near." I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. This is the gift of the crown of righteousness. The sixth crown is the crown of life. Reading from James chapter 1, there is a verse that says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. This is the crown of life, the sixth crown. The seventh crown is the crown of glory. From 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter says, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that never fades away. This, the seventh crown, is the crown of glory. So the, the seven crowns, uh, I'll just enumerate those again, are the crown of wisdom, the crown of honor, the crown of splendor or beauty, the crown of love, the crown of righteousness, the crown of life, and the crown of glory. These seven crowns uh, are, are gifts, opportunities. They are uh, a great um, 
a great knowing um, and a receiving of the one love and the one light that informs all things and that again is um, at the very core of who we are is one light and one life and one love. So these seven crowns um, are, as I'm shown it at this point anyway, seven colors of change, seven ways of receiving the fullness of who we are and returning to the full uh, root truth. And it, it is uh, receive the re uh, reception of or receiving of these seven crowns um, is in and of itself a, a coronation, um, and it, it also is a purification, and in a sense, a transfiguration, which I spoke about in videos last year, uh, if you want to go back and listen um, to those. Um, so those are the seven crowns that um, uh, are seven colors of change, and these will lead us um, sequentially into um, the fullness um, of um, that one light and one life and one love. There are three promises that I was al also given to share that um, are connected to various scriptural um, references, um, two from Revelation and one from Zechariah. I don't think I've ever quoted from Zechariah before, so that's a new one. Um, so the three promises are promises to the faithful, to those who endure and to those who shine like jewels in a crown. And this is the opportunity of this current time, which appears a crisis and it indeed is in many ways a crisis, but it is also uh, an opportunity because in the seed of every crisis, there is opportunity. There is the seed, a great potential and new birth and uh, enlightenment, um, enlightenment and, and a new pouring out of um, and receiving of the light and the life and the love that is um, beneath what appears to be uh, only chaos and only suffering and only loss. There is a gift to be received. So these three promises are additional gifts. Um, so the gift to the faithful is the first of the three promises. Um, Revelations Chapter 2, verse 10 says, Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. So again, that gift of life, the crown of life, the victor's crown that will be received to the faithful. It is a promise. The, the second promise is to those who endure, and the gift is a new name. From Revelation chapter 3, uh, verses 7 through 12, says this, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. So the second promise is to those who endure is given a new name. The third promise, we the people of God to those who shine like jewels in a crown. From Zechariah or Zechariah 9 verses 14 through 16. Then the Lord will appear over them. His arrow will flash like lightning. The sovereign Lord will sound the trumpet. He will march in the storms of the south and the Lord Almighty will shield them. 
The Lord their God will save his people on that day as a shepherd saves his flock. They will sparkle in his land like jewels in a crown. So the third promise is to the people of God, those who shine like jewels in a crown. And this is the shield of protection, not necessarily, uh, I want to be clear here, not necessarily protection from any certain uh, situation, but rather a lifting up um, and a revelation as jewels in a crown. So this is, is both opportunity and promise to be faithful, to endure, to shine, uh, as, and to let that line, light shine through us so that um, that sparkling of our God, our mighty God, might be seen and so that we might receive that new name and uh, be made into a pillar in the temple of God. And this is for all this is a gift freely given for all. And, and finally, back to that first promise that we will receive the victor's crown as we, um, we uh, live in an attitude of humility and service and are faithful to the tasks set before us. I want to end uh, with just a few thoughts. It's um, just on a personal note. I will share that uh, yeah, I, I, there's just quite, there's there's so much, honestly, that I have not shared in terms of um, individual journey, um, and it's it's been a little, a um, lot of ups and downs, um, and as I mentioned, I believe in a, um, when I was actually in an up place, I believe in the fall, I mentioned the rocky road to redemption, um, and, and it's interesting, I just, you know, several weeks ago, I, you know, I was like, wow, I didn't even realize it was, um, Lent, or you know, like I did when it started, but I, I've just been in a different sort of um, place for a variety of personal reasons, um, uh, and a, a literal place <laughs> has been shifting quite a bit. And uh, with with you know, that's my own little level of, of chaos at the moment. But I've been thinking often about um, a crown nature's crown and, and the crown of thorns and at the same time I've been very ambivalent about you know I, I typically have done a, I think since I've been sharing YouTube videos anyway I've done a some form of an Easter sharing and I just haven't really felt drawn to do that at all this year we'll see what happens but I was guided very strongly to release this video um, on the 15th of March even before um, I didn't know what I'd be speaking about, actually, but before, you know, some of um, what has unfolded in this last week in our world, and I've been reflecting on the crown of thorns and the crown of many crowns, and so uh, rather than me sharing, because it would be a bit discombobulated if I just, you know, tried to speak to that at this moment, I may say more later about some of what I've been reflecting about, but um, rather than doing that in this video, I want to close by just reading again from um, the biblical narrative. Um, I'm gonna read from Matthew and John, and then I'm gonna close with uh, the lyrics, uh, or a, the, a hymn text actually, to a hymn that many will be familiar with who, who grew up in, um, in uh, and who, have attended or do attend um, um, churches in the Christian tradition. So I'm going to just close with the, the hymn text for Crown Him with Many Crowns, which is one of my favorite Easter hymns. And I'm, I'm doing that just in the event that I don't record uh, an Easter message this year, then, then allow that to be a bit of an Easter message. So the crown of thorns. And, and my point here is that we are... There is a transition underway from a, um, a suffering, an identification with suffering. Or there's an opportunity for this transformation anyway, or transition from um, a view of Jesus the Christ uh, in that suffering servant role of the crown of thorns to taking his rightful throne and receiving the crown of crowns and there's also, because Jesus' life 
and death and resurrection was a teaching. There is also the opportunity to receive the seven crowns, which I mentioned, and then also to follow in, to walk in the way of life in the way that Jesus taught us. But to honor the way in, um, the way that he walked in terms of the Via Doloroso and the way of um, way of suffering is what it was uh, referred to, that road to the cross. Um, both um, all the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, tell basically the same story. And I'm just going to pick, I'm going to read from Matthew. Um, so listen for the crown here. Um, Matthew 27, uh, starting with about 28, verse 28. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. I also want to share from John, interestingly, chapter 19. This is the narrative that John provides us with in terms of this time um, that led up to the death of Yeshua ben Joseph, Jesus the Christ, beginning uh, the beginning of the chapter of chapter 19. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they slapped him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against this man. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and he sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which is in the Aramaic called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. So there we hear... Uh, in all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, about this crown of thorns and the place of the skull, Golgotha. I want to share finally from the scripture from Revelation, guess what chapter? Chapter 19, that's right. So we've just read from John chapter 19, and here is Revelation chapter 19. I'll begin with about verse 11. I saw heaven standing open, 
And there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I'll close this video by sharing the hymn text written by Matthew Bridges to crown him with many crowns. I do encourage you to go listen to it. It's a beautiful, beautiful hymn. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake, my soul, and sing of him who died for thee, and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Crown him the virgin son, the God incarnate born, whose arm those crimson trophies won, which now his brow adorn. Fruit of the mystic tree, as of that tree the stern, the root whence flows thy mercy free, the babe of Bethlehem. Crown him the Lord of love, behold his hands and side, rich wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified. No angel in the sky can fully bear that sight, but downward bends his burning eye, all mysteries so bright. Crown him the Lord of peace, whose power a scepter sways, from pole to pole that wars may cease, and all be prayer and praise. His reign shall know no end, and round his pierced feet fair flowers of glory now extend their fragrance ever sweet. Crown him the Lord of years, the potentate of time, creator of the rolling spheres ineffably sublime. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for thou hast died for me. Thy praise shall never, never fail throughout eternity. Many blessings and much love.